So, did you manage to see that that fight, that match between Heavy Rex and Minkara? I know, right? I know, right? A whole year and a half of waiting, and it was worth it. I know. Sure, there wasn't really sure the footage was a bit mad due to that old storm thing, but hey, at least we enjoyed what we could see, right? Yeah. And yes. I, I knew he would he would go with Bone Button. I knew it from the very start he would go with Bone Button. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I look forward to seeing the battle with Destro Galga and the Blue Knight of Titan. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, we'll we'll find out what's going on with that whole gauntlet quest thing. Yeah, right. Okay. Alright, okay. Bye. Ah, oh, uh, Hello again, hello and welcome, welcome back to the Anorak Review Show with I, your host, the Anorak. Yeah, sorry there was, there was a bit of a delay for our supposed 25th episode. It's just that a couple of things kind of delayed it a bit, delayed work on it a bit, such as the, such as the whole anticipating for that whole sport game thing, not just, not just the football, but also the contest of champions finally getting underway, which presumably hopes the that Iron Storm is passing sometime soon. As well as other holidays like Father's Day, the Summer Solstice, and possibly my birthday just a week ago. But we all got all that aside and finally get to our 25th episode. So to celebrate this occasion, let's actually talk about Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Emerson, Lake and Palmer, or ELP for short, were essentially a prog rock supergroup that spanned across the 1970s, consisting of a trio of Keith Emerson of The Nice, um, Greg Glake of King Crimson, and Carl Palmer, who had been a drummer for many bands such as Asia, Atomic Rooster, and even the crazy world of Atomic Rooster. If the Electric Light Orchestra could be described as a simple Beatlesque rock band with a couple of stringed instruments, Emerson, Lake and Palmer were the ones that, that literally attempted to combine both rock and classical music styles and genres. Actually combining the, the extended sessions with the grandiose bombasticness of their guitar and, and hammered organ solos. And it's kind of because of that that they've been kind of dismissed by the media as just another pretentious, overtly bombastic prog rock band. Which is kind of a thing, and I do like those kind of bands. Hell, many, many Japanese video game composers like Kojun Kondo and Oboyo Ometsu, I'm probably, again, I'm probably butchering those names, who have composed for many Nintendo games and even the Final Fantasy series, had considered this band to be a major influence on their work. And regardless of, and the top of all that, they still gained a cult following. Even after the tragic passing of Keith Emerson and Greg Lake about five years ago, their legacy still lives on, especially with Carl Palmer kind of carrying on their music and their songs in the form of legacies and trippies and whatnot. And today, I'm here to talk about what is, what could be seen as probably the pinnacle of ELP's work. Released in 1971, just over 50 years ago, their second album, the simply titled Tychus. And and look and going from the cover, it's simply iconic and recognizable. It is the work of a man who, who I could who goes by the name of William Neal. This is his this is his paintings right here, and it's both very minimal and almost still gets off that kind of apocalyptic feel with with that with the various scattered bones and the very name itself, Tarkus, is essentially a combination of the words Tartarus and Carcus. And in keeping with that that theme of combining, the the, the Tarkus is essentially a World War One style tank mixed with a mecha armadillo, a, me a mechanadillo if you will, a tankadillo if you will. And 
in a way, this Tigers fella could be seen as just as the mascot of ELP, or even the prog rock genre as a whole. And 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 love and most of all, I'm a sucker for gate faults. Here is kind of the illustrations of the various creatures that the Tarkus faces, in, such as the Stone of Years, the Manticore, etc. Almost kind of like a visualization of the actual music of the suite we'll, that we were talking about. Which, speaking of, let's actually talk about the music and see if it still holds up even after over 50 years. We begin the album, of course, with the titular suite, Tychus. Now, naturally, this is a 20 minutes suite with seven parts. So, I'm going to, so, like anything, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to divide this into each part, kind of judge each on its own, while also as part of this overall symphony. Starting, of course, with part one, Eruption. We begin this tale at about, at the time before time, if you will, as, as, the song, as the music begins with this ominous fading sound that always sounds like a choir, and a few seconds in, as soon as it builds up, it then smashes down into a nightmarish kind of it's almost psychedelic collage of synths and Hammond or of classic Hammond organs, obviously trying, obviously representing the imagery of an erupting volcano. Almost bit, almost reminds me a bit of Rite of Spring from Fantasia. And across this cult, this bombastic Hammond, just a just big hammered organ on Castro is here we we witnessed with our ears the birth of the tigers being hatched from an egg while this little young strange creature escapes from this eruption if you will we never entirely know what this creature truly is or where it comes where it came from or even how it came to be and I kind of like that. It was intentionally left ambiguous by the band, and I think it's probably for the better. I I think I kind of prefer it when things are kind of some some things are kind of left a mystery to kind of be brought to just to be left to the interpretation of the listeners and people hearing and enjoying this kind of music. Soon enough, the nightmarish cascade of musical magma and lava eventually settle down as we're brought to the second section, Stones of Years, the first of which to have vocals, of course, done by Greg Lake. A more dark, almost jazzy song, more rem a bit more reminiscent of King Crimson's work, and the creature representing this section is probably the weirdest of the bunch in my opinion, probably even more odd than Target himself. This thing right here, I don't know what this thing's supposed to be. He kinda looks as if he looks it looks as if Java's Palace got possessed by some Lovecraftian horror or something. As for the lyrics in question, they seem to be from a second person's perspective with lines such as have you talked to the winds of time or has the dawn seen your eyes it's not like the most of the most of the lyrics of this song or rather epic suite aren't explicitly about the target creature at least like i said explicitly in some way it could be interpreted as just, as a kind of monologue from the Tychus himself, or someone, or the fellow creatures he fights, or some third person pers individual that's witnessing this creature and these strange abnormal events. Ironically though, this, this individual that Greg seems to sing to 
judging from the way of it, it seems to indicate this person has years of experience, years of virtues and sin and sins. Yet, at this point, the Targus creature had just already been born and facing his first adversary. So, was there like a passage of time in between as as it kind of grew up or something? I don't know. But regardless, naturally, considering the first creature, or Stones of Years, is, like I said, a Jabba's palace possessed by Lovecraft Slug, Tarkus deems it a freak of nature, more so than itself, and just slays it and carries on like normal. However, this sense of serenity is abruptly interrupted by a bump by a barrage of sl of slamming percussions and jittering organs pieces that make up the bulk of this very short third section, Iconoclast. Represented by this pterodactyl looking dude, right here, who I could describe as, or shall we say, if Rodan and if Rodan from the Gods of the Movies and Spook from Transformers ever had a love child and decided to modify himself after a Spitfire. That's how I describe Iconoclast. And very fitting since the music I, I mentioned describing this does kind of in some way represent the intensity of an airstrike battle like planes firing, ricocheting and firing at each other. And, in a way, it kind of represents how man created these jets to battle each other in the First and Second World Wars especially. Aside from that though, it's another instrumental like Eruption, however, this feels definitely fast paced. It almost sounds like the theme music of a boss battle in an old like 8-bit or 16-bit video game, which, which as I've mentioned Final Fantasy earlier, is pretty evident. Hell, the the actual climactic bit where we pretty much assume that Tarkus shoots down and kind of rams over Iconoclast, it does kind of sound like the the ending victory music that you hear at the end of every level at a, a Sonic the Hedgehog game or something. It really has that kind of video game boss battle quality to it, which is, which, as a bit of a game of myself, a retro game in particular, I especially enjoy that. And, of course, being the shortest, it soon gets abrupted by the, the fourth and next session, simply called Mars. A more trippy, uh, more psychedelic song, which, considering Emerson, Lake and Palmer, is saying something that has lyrics, much like Son of Years, but this time actually deal with a, a certain theme here. It kind of deals with religious figures, or at least religious roles and positions like a bishop, a preacher, and uh, a minister, and etc. Each of which committing some kind of ironic or some kind of sin that kind of place kind of deconstructs the kind of religious people that were very present back in like the 60s and 70s and it's kind of interesting in a way the the the, the name of the previous section iconoclast is actually an, an actual word which refers to someone who critiques or destroys joys like symbols of of worship mainly of like symbols mainly of worship or like of a nation or just any symbols really just a destroyer of icons while the mass may refer to a specific kind of surf service that is celebrated by certain Christians specifically of the Catholic kind so with that said in a way this piece kind of kind of comments on both the people who just jump to prejudging and attacking people just for having a certain faith or a different faith, while also still going at the people who 
blindly agree with everything their face says without question, all the while committing acts that they're otherwise forbidden to do, cardinal sin and all that. However, this is also, I would also consider this the kind of centerpiece of the Tarka suite, not only being the very middle of it, but also kind of, kind of, in a way, just kind of summing up the themes of destruction, not only of a physical sense, but also of our individuality, our spirituality, how we abuse nature and ourselves to gain power and to build ourselves as the stronger people, as, as the dominant species of Earth. This is especially evident with the recurring line of the weaver in the web that he made, as if to indicate of those who try to try to create a web to trap and catch other people for committing sins, only to be caught by their very own traps because they commit the very same sins that they're told to hate, they're told to disapprove of. As, and aside from that, this piece is all still very catchy and very, very, very bouncy and very fun. It has, still has the awesome drums by Carl, and it has that very jaunty, very recognizable organ riffs by Keith himself. And especially in, in the middle, middle bit, which, which I think is the true center of the Tiger Suite, it just kind of rush it just it just fills you with 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 adrenaline and and all sort and all just sorts of activeness it's almost a kind of kind of hallucinogenic kind of track just kind of representing the madness of it all in a way just just the incomprehensible of the human nature and much like stoners of the years and iconoclasts this piece is also represented by a certain adversary of the Tychus. This time a very, not as odd, but still very surreal looking nonetheless. Almost with like a mix of a reptile, grasshopper, and just like some kind of missile launcher thing. I mean, forget how, how exactly it would move around, I guess it could just kind of, kind of, kind of hops or bounce with its very thin legs. How would it exactly see where it, where it's going? I mean, at least with Stone of Years and Iconoclast have eyes of their own and some targets as well. What exactly does this see from? Is it like, is it like a Xeomorph where it just kind of like, kind of senses everything for like a base player or something? I don't know. Well, it's probably because of that blindness that it too got taken down by the Tychus. However, this wouldn't be the, one, the luck would soon run out, as Ta as Tog himself faces his next and last adversary in the next session of the suite, the Manticore. Much like Iconoclast, this is another inch, a very very fast piece, very jarring yet still very epic kind of short instrumental that has fast paced instruments, percussion in particular. And just, just Keith's trademark organs just kind of haunting, giving a very fast-paced atmosphere, and almost almost visualizing a battle of beasts, of course. As in this case, the Tarkus, as I mentioned, faces faces the last and most famous adversary, the Manticore. This very bizarre fellow up here. Very big lips for that man for that manticore, by the way. And and of course, as you expect, the Tychus actually loses to this creature, getting a sting to the eye. Almost gruesomely, in fact. Not point blood per se, but it do, you do really do get that feeling, not not just in the artwork, but also in the music. It does have that kind of brutality, that brute force. 
in just just the combination of the drums, organ, and guitar alone. And the few bits that the Keith plays the organs calmly while being paused every now and then by the clattering drums of Cole Palmer, that, that alone can send a, send a chill up the spine. And just like a color clock, it does sound like like classic video game boss music, like something out of Earthbound or something. We then transition, rather seamlessly in fact, to the next section, Battlefield, which deals with the aftermaths of the fight between Tarkus and Manticore, and its lyrics seem to do, do explicitly deal with a lot of apocalyptic or other post-apocalyptic themes and imagery, not unlike, say, 21st Century Schizo in my by King Crimson or Child in Time by Deep Purple. And in fact, in some occasions when this when this piece was performed live, Greg Lake would occasionally sing a bit from the King Crimson song Epitaph, which is kind of thing, since they both kind of deal with the allegories of 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 war uh, and just the consequences of it, and and how the reason some people some people just engage in war between nations for is just for either for the sake of domination and power and especially welfare and wealth and and as the song here would say profit from victory. Said consequences also would be more apparent when it comes at the costs of many innocent lives, in particular starving children as said earlier, and that minute long guitar bit by Greg, Land Greg Grand Lake himself is such a beauty, it, it helps emphasize the sorrow of this, of this particular session, and for lack of a better if you pun the pun, it gently weeps. That's all I can say for that. And it and in a way, this is Tarkus's realization that he is merely a machine of war. He is this man-made mess of of cold, heartless metal and steel, and being defeated by the Manticore, who, by the way is the only fully organic creature of these characters is is help is making him realize that he may not be the dominant cre dominant beast of this this strange world and and this also this eventually segues very well into the next and final section of Tarkus Aqua Tarkus. A, a literal instrumental funeral march that kind of continues off a bit of a motif from the battlefield section and kind of brings this whole thing to a conclusion of sorts as, as Tarkus himself kind of leaves the land to go back to the sea. Almost a kind of reverse evolution how most if not all life came from the ocean and into the land he was born out of land and fire and is going into the ocean to become to be reborn as Aquatarchus as demonstrated in the very last corner of this little section here where you could see the poor fellow still bleeding out of his eyes no less must have been leaving a, must have been leaving a trail Along, along that way. Regardless, though, this kind of feels, this does feel like, does feel like a send off to him, with, with Carl Palmer's drums, especially definitely emphasizing that dr that marching feel, and, and and Keith Emerson's synth, kind of, you know, just giving off this. Bittersweet triumphant vibe to it, not entirely a victory, but not complete defeat. Just 
kind of being bruised down and out per se. Almost almost like a buried but not dead yet kind of scenario. And just when you and just when you think it all kind of fades away, you think it's gonna end, it however kind of it kind of it surprises you with with what sounds like a gong smash and and a return to the original eruption theme as if it's starting all over again however just when you think it's gonna truly start all over again it just it just comes to this for like if I could describe it in words just this dark almost brass like closer closer that almost sounds like something out of the Mars section from Gustav's planet suite or something as if to indicate that 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 aqua that Tarkus or rather aqua Tarkus would return someday which we've yet to see as if the cycle is starting over which is something I've been wanting to allude to up to this point the Tarkus suite kind of acts like a kind of self-reflection figuratively and literally we have the opening and closing bits eruption and aquatarchus then we have the somewhat calm and, and un, kind of almost soothing vocal pieces stones of years and battlefield then we have the short fast-paced almost clattering instrumental pieces Iconoclast and, and Manticore and Mars kind of being the center bit of it. We have the two verses at like actually four verses at at the beginning and at the end with that uh, that organ solo of like of Keith Emerson in the very center, almost the core of Tarkus itself. And boy is it just an epic closure that that just kind of kind of strikes at the heart, if you will. Whew. Blimey, I, I, this review's gone probably a lot longer than the actual suite itself, and I've no doubt it's going to be almost as long as the overall album itself. Speaking of which, with side one done, let's actually start talking about side two. We go from the longest track of the album to the shortest track of the album, Jeremy Bender. At about 1 minute and about 49-ish seconds, this is a very, very, very quick change of mood from, the, from Tarkus. Almost a juxtaposition of tone and atmosphere. This is essentially just a jaunty, piano-centric, honky-tonk kind of track. Almost like almost something you'd hear out of a vaudeville or like a one of those kind of stereotypical cowboy western saloons or something. And its lyrics are about a guy named Jeremy who decides to dress up as a nun and sh some short shenanigans ensue. It's 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 weird. It's surreal. It's almost it's almost Python esque. It's almost Python esque with its with its absurd yet seemingly mundane kind of humor, as if this Jeremy character is is trying to get on with fellow nuns, but he kind of kind of screws up ro royally and kind of fails miserably. So he just kind of kind of gives up on the whole nun business and just dresses as as a normal guy and just kind of walk out on the thing it's i do like i do like songs like this that just that are kind of just <clears throat> that are still kind of humorous and just all around just strange and funny just take the mundane and make something absurd about it i do like songs like that similarly the next song whose name and title i'm probably not going to be able to say without having to risk demonetization so I'm just gonna call it B word crystal also has a bit of a similar similar jaunty honky-tonk vibe to it albeit 
much longer and a bit more multi-layered, in a way. Its verses and lyrics, if I can even call them that, are very short, but they do seem to reference a lot about witchcraft and sorcery and fortune telling and whatnot. Almost as if it's a kind of allegory for something. I don't know. I'm I'm sure I'm sure either Keith or Greg probably knew something about it. Or they just kind of kind of just just threw whatever words they could think of whenever they could thought of like well magic and of course witchcraft wizardry and all that and just kind of just just kind of wrote them all down on like like a fridge like like magnets on a fridge or something and just kind of went along with it it still has that kind of like i said it still has that kind of jauntiness like jeremy bender albeit much more kind of like I said, it's much longer, and there is a, still a bit of a more, slightly more complexity, but still simple enough that it that it's very easy to kind of understand. One of which would be what I would call the chorus of this song, going, Tortured spirits cry, fears in their eyes, ghostly images die. It's very... It's very, it's, it's, it's almost a very kind of grim imagery that kind of juxtaposes with the otherwise light-hearted music. And I think that was kind of the intention of it. Not only have it be minimalist, but also kind of discordant and very, very juxtaposition, juxtapositive. As if there is, there is a level of almost darkness to this kind of light-heartedness. I think this is one that's definitely very 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 open to interpretation almost as much as Tarkas. However I will say this though, is it just me or does the piano bits in this sound a bit like the music from that Pixar Luxo Jr. short film? Huh. Well anyways on to the next song. And that song being The Only Way, him in brackets. This begins with with a very clear and ominous church organ, which very sounds reminiscent of the, the many Toccatas and Fugues by young Sebastian Bach. And it is where Keith really does show his influences from such classical music and classical composers. And then the lyrics kick in, where they talk, where Greg sings about people attending and kneeling at church, and yet kind of questioning their beliefs, their, their beliefs in this God, and asking why did he lose six million Jews, which is a clear reference to the Holocaust. Much like Matt, the mass section from the Tiger Six Suite, the only way kind of deconstructs not just Christianity but kind of but religion and faith as a whole. Not necessarily bashing or being overtly negative or cool critic or critative about it, just kind of questioning and being curious and just kind of taking it apart bit by bit. Then at the last minute of the song, it, the organ gets set aside for another another mix of, p of percussion and piano and maybe a bit of guitar, I think? I'm not very sure. And some more of Greg Lake's sing vocals, singing more about references of being touched by an angel, how man is man-made, how we don't have to necessarily put all our entirely all our faiths and our destinies in some preconceived deity. We have our lives, we make our choices, we have, well, free will, despite what others may say otherwise. It's then followed up by infinite space conclusion brackets, no doubt named after a bit of a lyrical bit from the previous track. This kind of 
this is bit, this is essentially just an instrumental jam session between Keith Emerson's piano and Carl Palmer's percussion, and it's still a very good, good in bit of a good improv if it even is one, and it's it is kind of a it is a kind of track you'd hear if you'd want to just sit and relax, enjoy a good weekend or sunset or something. On the other hand, though, it could be brushed off as just as just prog rock filler by some. But to me, I, I don't mind this kind of track. It's calm. It's relaxing. It does carry on the kind of mood and tone and almost atmosphere that the only way kind of left off. Not really much in deep themes or anything. Just just music essentially for its own sake. Much like a lot of music by Sebastian Bach himself. Next is the penultimate track, A Time and a Place. Not to be confused with Yes's album and song, Time and a Place, which I'll probably look at another time, who knows. Anyways, this one definitely feels like the closest to sounding Tychus like, in that there is a there is there is a multi layer of organs and drums and and of course Greg Lake's vocals. And lyrics here are a bit more abstract to say the least, or le to say the least. There are some some ones you might get, like somewhere there's a hill where things are still where rainwater spill that no one can trace. And yet there's also some kind of weird mundane ones like sleep in a dream of butter milk cream so was Greg Lake dreaming about breakfast or something but aside from that this is still a very fun funky groovy song with with an almost catchy beat for a for a song of its genre and a song of its time it's, it's probably the closest that Elvis and Lake Apollo have done to to doing something like a classic Jimi Hendrix-esque kind of track. And it is definitely a song that I think should have been a single of the album. And so we come to the last track and conclusive song of the Targets album, Are You Ready Eddie? This is without a doubt just a simple jam rock and roll track. It almost feels like a parody of a conventional 1950s rock and roll song. Loosely influenced by a, a, a Bobby trope song, The Girl Can't Help It, this was apparently created as a somewhat little impromptu jam to celebrate their completion of the Tarkus album. And and you and you def and it definitely feels like a very fun and goofy send off to the album. It also has some noticeable, interesting bits of lyrics worth noting. While most of it is just the reoccurring "Are you ready, Eddie? Ready to rock and roll?" and all that, there are also bits like "Are you ready to pull down those phases?" which are obviously referencing the the fader switches. That you often see on a mixing desk while recording music, and as well as, are you ready to turn on your 16 tracks? Which, again, kind of references how each recording instrument would be a track of itself. Like you've got the kick drum, you got the you got the kick drum, you got the snare, you got the two overheads, then you got your bass, guitar, keyboards, etc. It is it is kind of it's both clever and it's both lighthearted and fun and just it doesn't this for something that's for a band that's often known for being bombastic, overblown, so deep. This I think this was a the band's opportunity to just come up with something fun and goofy and just just all around have fun. And apparently by the end of it, there was a bit of a bit of a spoken word saying of a woman going, I've only got ham or cheese, which I think references, is a kind of reference to someone making some sandwiches for the band after they 
kind of finish the the usual session, which again is a bit of a clever insertion. And so overall, Emerson Lake and Palmer's Tarkus is a fantastic album. And I think most of that is I think most of the praise it does definitely come towards the suite. But I also think the songs of Side B are also worth giving a chance too. I think it's it's it may, it, to some it may seem clear that most of the focus, attention and effort were put on the Tarkis suite and the the songs of Psyche were just kind of an afterthought. But I think they're still fine on their own and and I'm sure many ELP fans would would definitely love this album. And if you're a big prog rock fan or if you want to get into the prog rock genre or if you just like weird experimental epic music i say give tarkus of give tarkus a listen and see if it's worthwhile to you next time we hopefully get our episode schedules back on track by having a little revenge with the eurythmics